We advise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers that the following program contains images and voices of deceased persons. Just come over here for a sec. Three seconds, three shots. Don't stress, be calm. A white police officer <laughs> kills a young Aboriginal man. Stab at me, stab at me. Okay, okay. Let's go. Take your kids away, take your children. What this third world war coming? And a nation is torn apart. When we are going to get Justice! Tonight, we investigate what happened. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. November the 9th, 2019. In the remote Aboriginal community of Yuendamu, 300 kilometres northwest of Alice Springs. The Northern Territory's police immediate response team sets out to arrest 19-year-old Kuman J Walker. 29-year-old Constable Zachary Rolfe takes the lead. Whose house is this? Within an hour, Kumanjay is fatally shot. Rolf is charged with murder, and two years later, a jury will acquit him. Tonight, we're investigating whether this deadly outcome was preventable or worse, inevitable. Those two men should never have been standing face to face. Joining me, Colleen Gwynne, former commander of crime in the Northern Territory Police Force. They should never have been in that situation, but once you are, there is no getting out of it. Human rights barrister Raymond Broomhall. To me, that was outrageous. The fact that this man needed medical treatment, but no, he was dragged out. Dr Thalia Anthony, Professor of Law at the University of Technology, Sydney. It looks like a community under siege, a community that is being invaded by a paramilitary-like force. And Ned Hargraves, Walpuri elder from the Yuendamu community where Kumanjay Walker lived and died. The thing is, are we going to get justice? Assertive white cop, troubled Aboriginal teenager, glib and frankly unhelpful descriptions of the two young men at the centre of this case. So what do we know about Kumanjai Walker and Zachary Rolfe? Tell me about Kumanjai. Ned, describe this young man to me. As Kumanjai was growing up, he was a very quiet person and always wanting to do something, act a go hunting. He was always wanting to learn from us his culture, and he was gentle and someone very, very special. It's hard to conceptualise the impact of Kumanjay's death on community. It's been so big, and I don't think we'll really understand it until a whole generation has passed. Samara Fernandez-Brown grieves the loss of Kumanjay, the cousin who used to stay with her in Adelaide as a child. How I remember Kumanjay most is when we were little kids and we'd spend a lot of time in Adelaide together. Then we'd just be hanging out, going to the park, watching cartoons. And one of sort of my fondest memories is watching Hey Arnold, because that was his name. It was just one of those funny things as a kid where you'd be like, oh, that's you, that's you, <laughs> when that cartoon character would come up and it would just make us all laugh. And so, like, for me, that's such a fond memory that I'll get to hold for a, sort of a lifetime now. To say 19-year-old Kumanjay Walker had a life of disadvantage hardly begins to describe it. 
He suffered fetal alcohol syndrome and was diagnosed with a mild to moderate intellectual disability. He was treated for a number of health issues that also impaired his hearing. Both his parents died while he was still a child and there's no doubt he struggled and had been in trouble with the law. Kumunje had committed a series of serious offences. He spent time in the Dondale Youth Detention Centre, which a Royal Commission found had, at the time, maltreated its young inmates. Ned, he was a troubled young man, would you agree? He was a trouble. But I say it's not the community that made him troubled would want him to look over the shoulder and say, who's coming to get me? Who's coming to get me, you know? And uh, the community really, really were worried about him. I think very early on in life, you lose your parents so young and then you live with kin and uh, you, you go from bed to bed probably. And, you know, it's a difficult life. You um, already develop a dependency on alcohol at a very young age. And so he had a really difficult start to life. Zachary Rolfe's life, by contrast, is one of privilege. He grew up in Canberra, his mother a solicitor, his father a luxury car dealer. Rolf was educated at an elite private school and then served five years in the Australian Defence Force as an infantry unit soldier and saw active service with the ADF in Afghanistan. The ADF was something that he found appealing and then um, saw some active service and decided that policing was pe perhaps a, you know, a, a natural progression from defence, but, you know, it, it, policing and, and defence force uh, mentality and approach is, it's pretty much like chalk and cheese, to be honest. In 2016, Rolf joined the Northern Territory Police Force and it seemed he would shine. Heroic police officers stripped down to their underwear. Just a week into the job, he rescued two tourists from the floodwaters of Alice Springs River and would later receive a National Police Bravery Award. We assessed the risks at each point, and I knew worst case scenario if um, I couldn't make it to the other side of the river both times that I would just um, go with the flow and just relax and take, let the current take me. I knew I'd... Thalia Anthony. When you look at Kumanjo and uh, Zachary Rolfe, they seemingly could not be two more different people. Yeah, in terms of opportunities, in terms of their ability to get an education, a job, to meet all the criteria, Rolf ticks every box and Kumanjai had access to none of those things. In a social aspect, bush policing is different than city policing. Uh, you might deal with situations differently. But Rolf's life has not been free of controversy. Get them, boys. Boots. Oh, boots. <laughs> <laughs> His career in the army included allegations of theft and lies, and his use of force as a police officer was questioned in court. A judge found he likely deliberately banged an Aboriginal man's head into the floor, leaving him unconscious, and that he believed Rolf then lied about it. Also, it would later be revealed it's my job to look after Neanderthals who drink too much alcohol. <laughs> Rolf exchanged racist text messages with fellow officers. Nah, bruh, just slightly annoying. <laughs> Coons, man. We feel as a community that Sakura Rolf is racist, that we've been mistreated by him and by the police force itself. November the 9th, 2019, was a day of great sorrow for the community of Yuandamu. The funeral of Kumanjay's grandfather, a time the Walpuri people call sorry business, a day of grief and responsibility for Kumanjay. Sorry business, the way that it happens is if there is a passing, you gather together and you mourn together. And it's just a way to create healing and a collective experience rather than 
you know, you're being on your own and mourning that person. So it, it was a very, very emotional time. At the time of his grandfather's passing, Kumanje was in court ordered detention at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre in Alice Springs. But according to Ned Hargraves, Kumanje, as the last surviving male in his immediate family, had a duty to be present for the Sorry business. How important was it for Kumanjai to be at Sorry business, at the funeral? Well, to me, it, it was so, so extremely important for him because he is the last kin of family that left him. The mother left him, the father left him. We say he had to be there. The family needed him. Yeah. Kumanje removed his electronic ankle bracelet, escaped the rehab centre and made the 300-kilometre trip to Yuendamu. He wanted to leave rehab and he didn't want to have the stigma of having the bracelet that was on his, on his leg and he wanted to remove that so as he could go to a funeral as an initiated man who had no influence off from the, the, the white man, so to speak. But Kumanje had broken the law and he was now in police sights. Coming up... This young person had threatened fellow police officers. The confrontation... He thought Smith and Hand were too soft. ..that caught the attention of Zachary Rolfe. You could see this warrior mentality. It was a hugely threatening and provocative situation. That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we're investigating the life and death of Kumanjay Walker. Mate, what's your name? Mate, it's not, mate. We're just asking you a question. No need to keep walking. The okay. circumstances that led to his shooting by Northern Territory Police Officer Zachary Rolfe. He was terrified because there was a man with a gun and he didn't know what to do. Two young men whose opposite worlds collide in one deadly and potentially preventable moment. They should never have been in that situation, but once you are, there is no getting out of it. It's Wednesday, the 6th of November, 2019 in the small community of Yuendamu. 19-year-old Kumanjay Walker is here for what's known as sorry business, a funeral for his grandfather. That young fella lost his mum, lost his dad. So he's the only one who's there to respect. And that moment was very important for him to be there, very important. But to be at sorry business, Kumanje has had to break out of a drug and alcohol rehab centre in Alice Springs, where he'd been detained by court order. And there was now a warrant out for his arrest. Three days before the funeral, local police officers from Yuendamu attempt to bring Kumanje in. Senior Constables Lanyon Smith and Chris Hand locate him at House 577 in the community. As their police body cameras show, Kumanje threatens them with an axe before dropping it and escaping into the bush. On the face of it, that's not a great scenario, is it, Colin? Oh, look, in terms of policing, that's pretty high risk. Colin Gwynn was a former commander of crime with the Northern Territory Police. In her opinion, despite the Yuendamu officers being armed... He's come through here. ..their response to this high-risk situation was admirable. In that situation, the police could see that he was heightened. He wanted to get away. And arming himself, in my view, wasn't to cause harm, but it was to raise the threat so he could flee. <laughs> You can see the police at the time stand back. OK, you go. Because there was nothing to be gained by trying to intervene at that point. It, was, it would, would have gone pear-shaped very quickly. 
It's this incident, however, that sets the groundwork for tragedy. With an influx of people expected for the funeral, local police call for support, and Acting Assistant Police Commissioner Travis Wurst agrees to send the immediate response team from Alice Springs. Constable Zachary Rolf is part of the team. The IRT believes it's been sent to arrest Kumanjay Walker. The team is made aware Kumanjay has already threatened local officers with an axe. And before leaving for Yuundamu, Rolf watches police body cam video of the incident repeatedly. When he looked at the body cam, he thought Smith and Hand were too soft. That footage that was watched over and over and over again, you could see this kind of warrior mentality because this young person had threatened fellow police officers. What the IRT doesn't seem to be aware of is that a peaceful arrest plan is already in place for Kumanjay, an agreement that he would turn himself in when the funeral was over. There was a very clear arrest plan in place that it wouldn't take place until the morning after the funeral so that he had time to be present and be at our grandfather's funeral and that family would support him in turning himself in the next morning. Local police sergeant Julie Frost and community police officer Derek Williams reached the agreement with Kuman Jay's relatives. What Julie did and Derek Williams did was terrific. Let's go and speak to them. Let's go and orchestrate this at a time that is culturally appropriate after a ceremony that he has to be at and bring him to the station and let's deal with what's, what we have to deal with. Soon after 6.30 p.m., Rolf and the heavily armed police immediate response team arrive in Yuandamu with a mission in mind to immediately arrest Kumanjay Walker. Thalia, from your perspective, it, uh, I'm imagining the IRT being brought in uh, really does escalate matters, doesn't it? Yeah, it absolutely signalled to the Yuandamu community that there were police officers in the community with assault rifles who were potentially going to use them. So Professor that... Thalia Anthony specialises in criminal justice for First Nations communities. It was a hugely threatening and provocative situation when all the advice really was to engage the family to assist with the arrest and yet the community's being sent a message that it would be dealt with through force. It should never have been approved in the first place for an IRT to go out there under those circumstances. And once in Yuandamu, Colleen believes the IRT failed to recognise the risks to the officers, the community and Kumanjay Walker. From a policing perspective, if you were going to uh, travel to a community two or 300 kilometres away to arrest an offender who you believe could be violent. You have a, a plan of attack. What, how are we going to do this? You have a really detailed risk assessment and the risk assessment is to do with the entire community. Mm. It's not just Kumanjai, it's not just the police, it's the community. You're... They went out there without any of that. The funeral for Kum and Jay's grandfather is still underway. We can go check inside. But within an hour of the IRT's arrival, Kum and Jay Walker will come face to face with Constable Zachary Rolf. Hey, mate, what's your name? I see he's a very dangerous man. He's completely went out of control. Stop there, stop, mate. He was a cowboy, really. Coming up. Just come over here for a That didn't door knock. Kum and Jay Walker's final minutes. They just went there and shot him. Take your kids away, take the children And the away, community's please. horror. I'm like, this just can't be real. There is no way that this happened and happened in this way and on this night. That's next on Under Investigation.
Tonight, we're investigating whether the tragic death of Kuman J. Walker was preventable or inevitable. It was a hugely threatening and provocative situation. Those two men should never have been standing face to face. It's now just after 7 p.m., sunset in Yuendamu. Constable Zachary Rolf with the Northern Territory Police immediate response team has just arrived. A briefing, albeit very short, is underway. Already in place is an agreement with the family that 19-year-old Kuman J. Walker will surrender himself later that night or police will arrest him early the next morning. But that plan seems to get lost or is otherwise ignored. Having run similar briefings and been a party to briefings in the past, that wasn't a briefing. To me, it should have been, there is a plan in place, Kumajai Walker will present here tomorrow. If he doesn't, then we revisit this. The IRT, comprising four heavily armed officers and a dog handler, heads out. Zachary Rolf, the former soldier, apparently leads them. Is that a... It's a, it's a, a recipe dangerous... for disaster. You have someone whose background is around lethal force. There should be a whole range of triggers that should highlight that this individual officer is high risk. And that should have happened and it never happened. Ned Hargraves, the reaction to the IRT arriving? When the community looked at it, they were afraid, scared, didn't know what was happening. Why these men with guns, big guns, doing in Udomo? For me, it looks like a community under siege. It looks like a community that is being invaded by a paramilitary-like force. Yes. Well, they were really, really, really completely shocked and also terrified. Hey, what this Third World War coming? It's clear the immediate response team is not patrolling as apparently instructed. Instead, they're searching house by house for Kumanjay. They reach house 577. Hey, man, my name's Zach where just three days before, Kumunje had confronted local police with an ax. Is he inside? Rolf enters, but Kumunje is not there. He's just outside. They move on towards house 511. You seen this man? Outside, this chilling exchange. A resident asks about their weapons, which includes an assault rifle, an AR-15. Why we have a gun? No, why well, he's got a gun. Ah. Yeah. We all carry guns. Yeah, no, but it's like got an aim to shoot someone. No, he's not aiming to shoot anyone, is he? Right. We don't we don't have a holster for that one, so we have to carry it, so. She said, Are you going to shoot someone? Yes. She asked, Are you gonna shoot someone? He said and then he said Someone probably shouldn't run at police with an axe. Well, if you're gonna come at police with an axe, that was the response that she got. Hey. Hey, mate, what's your name? As he walks to the entrance of House 511, Rolf will later testify he did not know the man he confronts inside is Kumanje. Right. Don't stress. Be calm. I'm going to put yeah. a photo next to your face and see who you are. Yeah. It's what happens next that is so shocking. So, that's, not me. that's not you? Kumanje yeah. is carrying yeah. a that pair of scissors. Yeah. And during a short struggle, Rolf is stabbed in the shoulder. Rolf fires his weapon three times in rapid succession at close range. It's all good. He was stabbing me. He was stabbing me. Okay, right? It's all good. Shots I was there. We heard the shot and people running, screaming out. Get around to the station here now. We need everybody here from the station. That moment was a very shocking and very terrifying moment. Now we're at House 511. Shots fired. Offenders arrested. He's been shot. Everybody scattered. Everybody don't know what to do. 
They were shot. Take your kids away. Take the children away, please. Colleen, it escalated so quickly. Were you surprised at how quickly that occurred? No, no, not in those situations. A, a second could feel like five minutes. When um, you are uh, ha have close range combat, that you, you almost go into a different world because you know that that is the riskiest situation for all involved. But Colleen, I mean, given that a few days previously there was an attempt to come at the police with an axe and they didn't respond like that, it wouldn't seem like this was par for the oh, course. I'm not saying that I think that they should have got themselves into that situation. They should never have been in that situation. But once they've walked in there and they've started that confrontation, you can't go back from it. Let's get him out of here. Let's get him out of here for our safety. When they shot him, they dragged him out like a dog. What are we doing? Are we going to the station? We're, going to the station. We're taking him to the station. Despite being shot at close range three times, Kumunje is still alive and is crying out for his mother, Leanne. His hands are cuffed behind his back and he is dragged into a police vehicle. We're gonna go to the station now. Bleeding and seriously injured, he's then driven the short distance to Yuandamu police station. Thalia, he is still alive and he's cuffed, but they know they've shot him three times and dragged out. So he's shot three times. It's very likely he's going to die. Um, and so the need to give him urgent medical assistance on the spot is absolutely blatant. And yet that's not what they do. They handcuff him and then drag him out of the house and then straight to the police cell. So none of that represents any care for his life. To me, that was outrageous. I mean, the, the fact that this man needed medical treatment and he needed immediate medical treatment, but no, he was dragged out. And what was really sad about the whole situation is that there was simply no medical assistance uh, in the community at all at, the, at that time. The community's medical staff had left that morning, with some saying they had concerns for their safety. They said they felt unsafe. Police said, go. To then execute what could be a high risk arrest, knowing the circumstances, to me just makes no sense at all. Um, it should have been an absolute consideration, one of the many considerations. Having to evacuate the nurses and have them sent away, it's, it's it, it was no reason, no good reason. Should the police have called flying doctors immediately? He's clearly in trouble. What, what would you have done? Well, they have, I, I would think they'd have to come anyway. They, their, their impression was is that they didn't want them to come because they were scared for their safety. So everybody now is... This, this situation has seemingly got totally out of control. At the police station, Rolf and the IR team attempt to treat Kumunjay, while an officer radios for assistance. We're going to need backup out here yeah. and air wing on the way. Outside, an increasingly distressed community is gathering. Cousin just got shot by the police and we don't know if he's OK. It includes Kumunjay's cousin, Samara Fernandez-Brown, who records the scene. We got told that he's been shot and that he was bleeding. We don't know by the police. No-one's told us if he's alive, if he's well. We were so frightened. We were so scared and confused because my mum was explaining Kumunjay's been shot and he's been taken to the police station. I'm like, this just can't be real. This just, there is no way that this happened and happened in this way and on this night, it just, none of it was making sense to me. Just over an hour after being shot, Kumunjay dies. Soon after, Rolf asks if body cameras are still rolling. Is it all? No, that's too much. Coming up... There's a ruse to all the community. Hey, there's an ambulance. Ah, Kumajo's finally getting into the Royal Flying Doctor Service aircraft. The police deception. They just sped straight to the end. Finding out the next morning that he was never on that plane. It was very cruel. And the public outrage. Consequences will flow as a result of that investigation. That's next on Under Investigation.
The community of Yuandamu is confused and in shock after the shooting of 19-year-old Kumanjay Walker. And they're not aware that Kumanjay is already dead. We got told that he's been shot. No one's told us if he's alive, if he's well. Inside the police station, 29-year-old Constable Zachary Rolf seeks treatment for the minor stab wound to his shoulder. Hey, bend, bend. 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 We just got some or something like that. But there is concern the growing crowd outside will soon turn hostile. So police come up with a plan to quietly and securely evacuate Rolf and the IR team. Up two, three hours, ambulance. When an ambulance arrives, the crowd assumes it's for Kumanjay. Late, late. An ambulance comes out, there's a ruse to all the community. Hey, there's an ambulance. Ah, Kumanjay's finally getting into the Royal Flying Doctor Service aircraft. But there is not a patient in the ambulance. And there's no flying doctor's aircraft. Instead, a police chartered plane, all part of a deceptive plan to secretly transport the immediate response team out of Yuandamu. They didn't tell us nothing. They just sped straight to the airstrip, the police, two police cars, ambulance. Kumanjay is left at the station, his body laying in a cell. We've still had no communication. You are. So, yeah, I don't know. Just then, just after four in the morning, nearly 10 hours after the shooting, Kumanjay's family is finally told the terrible truth. Finding out the next morning that not only had he passed away, but he'd passed away the night before and that he was never on that plane. I think it was just, it was very cruel. He was extremely cruel. For everyone, the horror of what had just happened was starting to sink in. A teenager has been shot dead by police in a remote part of the Northern Territory. When you have a very vulnerable young Aboriginal man in a community, and those people who are vested with that responsibility to maintain law and order and, and safety of those in the community, and then someone dies at the hands of that group, then, you know, obviously there's going to be an enormous reaction. Two days later, the Northern Territory's Chief Minister, Michael Gunner, flies to Yuandamu and makes a promise. And I can promise you that that investigation will be independent and the consequences will flow as a result of that investigation. Do you have anything to say to Mr Walker's family? The next day, Zachary Rolf becomes only the second police officer in the Northern Territory to ever be charged with the murder of a First Nations person. Has been charged with murder. <laughs> Rolf's supporters questioned the charge and the speed with which it was made. We were very strong and adamant and absolutely appalled with the decision to charge a, a Northern Territory police officer with murder. Thalia Anthony. There was much said about the hastiness of this. Uh, look, for a death in custody, it was relatively quick. For any other homicide where you know the person responsible for the killing, there would be an arrest straight away. There would be charges laid straight away. To, to just charge straight away without actually understanding all of the evidence, I think, was too hasty. I, I don't... I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. I, I believe that right. the evidence was extremely revealing. Uh, the footage camcord footage, any any lawyer would have looked at that and anybody in prosecutions would have seen that it was definitely... It, I, I, how could I say it? If it wasn't murder, it was manslaughter. Around the country... ..the streets erupt in protest. It takes almost two and a half years for the case to come to trial. And the day before, Zachary Rolf records a personal video for the media. I'm just um, in my hotel room up in Darwin, just pacing because my murder trial starts tomorrow morning. Um, doesn't really seem real, but I am looking forward to clearing my name after over two years. It was a polarising case because the expectations of the different sides in the community just could not be met. New South Wales barrister Philip Strickland was appointed by the Northern Territory 
to prosecute Zachary Rolf and agreed to this exclusive interview. The Indonesian community were outraged that one of their members had been shot and then a number of the officers working with Mr Rolf were outraged that he was charged at all. It's a short walk to court, but for Zachary Rolf, it's been a long road to trial. On February the 7th, 2022, Zachary Rolf's trial begins, and the carefully selected jury members take their seats. Because it was a murder case, each side had 12 challenges without cause. That is, you don't need any basis to challenge the jury. How many challenges did the defence take? I don't remember exactly, but they they used either all or most of the 12 they had. And who were they challenging? They were Indigenous uh, members of the panel. There were Torres Strait Islander members of the panel. There were darker-skinned people. Uh, all I can say is the actual jury that was selected, there was one Asian and the rest, as I can recall it, were Anglo-Saxon. Did that concern you? I would just say that is a consequence that can flow from allowing 12 challenges. Because if either the Crown or the accused want to exclude First Nation people from the jury with 12 challenges, they can do that. This was never going to be an easy case for the jury based on independent advice on police firearms protocols, the prosecution made a remarkable concession, accepting that Rolf's first shot was in self-defence. There's no doubt making the concession was a great boon for the accused because they were able to say, well, the second and third shots only were 2.6 seconds and three seconds later. Now you're forced to argue this is something changes after the first Correct. shot. How difficult was that? Well, that was the whole case, really. That was the, that was the guts of the case. The prosecution experts claimed that because Kumanje was pinned down after the first shot, he was unable to use the scissors he held, and that Rolf and his partner, Adam Ebull, could have disarmed him. Instead, Rolf fired two more shots, and medical opinion was that either the second or third of the three shots caused fatal damage. It's all good, he was stabbing me, he was stabbing me. Oh, okay, stabbing. Russ. It's all good, he's got scissors in his hand. The accused could have waited by using some kind of defensive tactics himself to try and remove the scissors from the hand, which was pinned down, without having to shoot him. That was our case. So our whole case was, yes, there was a very significant change in those 2.6 seconds. I'm afraid I just don't agree with him on that at all. And this is the whole issue, that the, the prosecution conceded that the first shot was lawful. And because they conceded that the first shot was lawful, that meant all the other shots were lawful. It was a, it was a no-brainer. It was almost by that concession saying that, it was over Red Road. Conceding any shot was lawful is unacceptable to our legal experts, Ray Broomhall and Professor Thalia Anthony, because both believe Rolf and Ebull should never have stepped inside the house. They entered the property without permission from the owner. And without permission, neither officer, it's argued, had the legal right to go inside. Hey, missus. Mr Rolf's evidence was that he was not sure whether Kuminjai Walker was in the house. That's and right. therefore he needed the consent of the owner to go into the house. So my point is, if he didn't have a reasonable belief that Kuminjai was in the house, he wasn't really allowed to walk into that house. He was if he had the consent of the owner and he said he believed he had the consent. They didn't knock. They didn't have a reasonable suspicion that Kumanjai Walker was in the house. All the requirements for entry. Whose house is this? Margaret's, but they... On his body cam, Rolf we'll is told inside. the house is owned by Margaret. Go check inside? All right. Ned Hargrave says Rolf is being told Margaret is not what present, is that what? she is away. What are they saying to the police? Really? 
Please don't go in. Wait for Margaret to come back. It's clear Rolf does not try to find Margaret. The court accepts his belief that he had permission, but the court did not hear from Margaret on that issue. I see the blue light and um, red light. He was called around the corner really fast. Margaret is Kumanje's grandmother. English is not her first language, but she told us she did not give Rolf permission to enter her house. The Rolf can come to my place, no permission. Colleen Gwynn. To me, it doesn't look like he had permission. So, and Ray, based on that, you think it could be flipped, this case? Very much so. The very fact that they were even in the premises unlawfully meant that they couldn't rely on that defence. They couldn't rely on self-defence because they had unlawfully entered the That's premises. That's correct. In fact, the, re the onus is reversed in that Kumaja had every right to defend himself. In March 2022, in the Northern Territory Supreme Court, the jury finds Zachary Rolfe not guilty on charges of murder, manslaughter and engaging in a violent act causing death. His win is a devastating loss to Kum and Jay's family. I'm really happy with the result, really happy for my family and my friends, for the police force and especially my mum. When we are going to get Justice! Coming up, the case continues. The Northern Territory is a jurisdiction where there is significant racism. But this time, the Northern Territory Police Force is on trial, and Zachary Rolf is their accuser. There is no room for racism. We can't have those people like that. That's next on Under Investigation. Jay Walker was not murdered. Zachary Rolfe did not commit a crime. But this most divisive and tragic case makes it clear justice isn't only about the law. Jails. It's also about First Nations people. A full of our children. Too often deprived and misunderstood, being shoehorned into a you system said that simply doesn't fit. They broke your law. It's why our investigation tonight asks, was Kuman J. Walker's death preventable? He was a strong young man. Or shockingly, was it inevitable? He was someone special. I think Kuman J. is a product of the system in which he grew up. And so you have a system that is bent on criminalising him and not on supporting him. And the culmination of that was his death. Ironically, it is Zachary Rolfe who has opened a critical window into that system, just a few weeks ago in Alice Springs at the coronial inquest into Kuman Jay's death. He is given immunity to testify, and in the witness box, he makes some damning claims. Rolfe says racist language is used everywhere within the Northern Territory Police Force. Well, the same as across the police, like you'd hear the terms coon and the N-word. And his shocking claims also included allegations of an annual awards night by the Tactical Response Group. Certificates presented to the coroner as evidence included this, the Sooty Award. The TRG denies it is racist, but the Territory's Independent Commissioner Against Corruption is now investigating. Ned, was it painful to hear that he claimed so many others spoke like that? Well, to me, it was really painful, and I didn't, didn't really want to hear that, and I couldn't believe it, you know? Really? Why, why people are in those jobs, really. They should be kicked out of the job because you, there is no room for racism. We can't have those people like that. Talia, can 
Zachary Rolfe put forward an argument that ultimately all of this created the situation he found himself in. I think there is an element of truth to it that we can't expect to have this culture of racism without officers then feeling like they're validated to use force against Aboriginal people. It's a consequence of a racist culture. The Northern Territory is a jurisdiction where there is significant racism. There, you, you hear it. Um, you deal with it. It's, um, you see it in sport there. You see it in the, um, all facets of um, the community in the Northern Territory. Colleen Gwynn, who spent over a decade in the senior ranks of the Northern Territory Police, acknowledges she too was guilty of a racist comment. Joining the Northern Territory Police in 1988, I was quite shocked about the levels of racism. And, you know, I myself has been known to use uh, a racist slur in a private conversation that I was just devastated by. It's something she says she'll forever regret. But she also believes there's another problem with the force. It's militarisation, a consequence, she says, of increasingly hiring former defence personnel, soldiers like Zachary Rolfe. From 2010, there was over 700 ex-military applied for the Northern Territory Police, a lot of them successful. The reality is that we saw evidence in the inquest that they're twice as likely to use force. The service has to change. We, we have to stop the militarisation. Let's go back to uniforms that aren't nearly black, that look intimidating. Actually, how about we just go back and start talking to people again and, and understanding uh, the, the really powerful cultures of those people um, that we are supposed to be serving and protecting. And this is work, Liz, this is hard work, but it has to be done for the future of our First Nations people. I want to just leave us with this question. Do we all agree this was a preventable death? Oh, absolutely. It should never have happened. Preventable at so many stages, not just in the final moments, but so many people could have stopped the IRT going to the community, stopped the carrying of weapons. But at every stage, it contributed to the, the killing of a young man. It all may have been so different if local Indigenous police officer Derek Williams was on duty that day. Instead, he was at the funeral. He's Kumanjay's uncle, and he'd helped negotiate the plan to peacefully arrest his nephew days earlier, only to spend the night outside the police station trying to calm the community when that plan was seemingly ignored. He was the absolute hero. And if only the police, his fellow colleagues, saw that he was the one that confronted 200 people, said, here I am, and he had them under control. That shows courage and it shows just how incredible and how important it is to have someone like Derek Williams on the ground. Ned. Yeah, uh, just one thing. Uh, Karangila Mohajari, ceasefire. No guns. My community, my people want to move ahead, but with a good plan, good solutions, good way of doing things, understanding the community. That's what it needs. We can't go on like this. It's not good. I thank you. And if you have any information regarding the death of Kumanjai Walker that you think is important, we'd like to hear from you. Our address is under investigation at nine.com.au. Thank you all very much for joining me. Thank you, Ned. Thank you. And I thank you. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night.